Welcome to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we aim to take you to the heart of ag policy. I'm Spencer Chase. Our guest this week is former Ag Secretary Dan Glickman, who joins us to offer his thoughts on global food security. But first, here's this week's headlines. The Biden administration announced the first phase of its plans to walk back Trump-era changes to the reviews conducted under the National Environmental Policy Act. NEPA reviews will now require federal agencies to evaluate all relevant environmental impacts of decisions on everything from road construction to grazing permits. The Council on Environmental Quality published a rule Tuesday to make the changes it says are necessary to restore the full authority of agencies to find alternative approaches. But ag groups like the Public Lands Council and National Cattlemen's Beef Association argued the changes would return environmental analysis to a failed model. The Department of Agriculture will be in the driver's seat for a new initiative aimed at streamlining rural services across the federal government. USDA will lead the Rural Partners Network, which aims to leverage resources across the government to help different agencies partner with rural communities to generate economic opportunity. The initiative will launch in several communities throughout Georgia, Kentucky, Mississippi, New Mexico, and some tribal areas within Arizona. Areas within those states will receive individualized supports to help navigate federal programs and pursue solutions that might work best for their communities. And finally, global finance leaders sounded the alarm this week about the rising cost of food and the serious implications it might have for stability in the world. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen joined World Bank and International Monetary Fund leaders in a virtual event this week. The IMF is now projecting global food prices will rise 14% this year, outpacing the anticipated 5.7% inflation in advanced economies and the 8.7% rise in poorer economies. A major factor in the rising cost of food around the world has been the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which has thrown commodity exports from both countries into disarray. It's a situation that former Ag Secretary Dan Glickman says should command the world's attention. Well, it's a pretty big deal in terms of uh, long-term food security for not only the developed world, but particularly the developing world where you could have a lot of political instability and crises and famine and and uh, war. And so, you know, this was kind of a pre-existing problem before uh, the Ukrainian situation. But the fact that Ukraine and Russia are such big factors in the global grain market, particularly in wheat and sunflower oil, I think the IMF has now finally recognized the importance of food security in the world. You know, these were relegated to secondary issues, unfortunately, until recently. Mm -hmm. So obviously in a a moment like this, there's a lot of different uh, problems and there's a lot of different potential solutions being thrown out there. But in your mind, as someone who's been in in the secretary's chair, what, what is there for the Biden administration to do to help alleviate this crisis? You know, I think they have moved to try to release some oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to bring down you know, energy prices a bit. It's not going to have a long-term effect, but it certainly helps a little bit in the short term. They dumped some stuff on ethanol, uh, which I think uh, will be helpful in certain parts of the country. Um, you know, I, I, they may look at opening up some uh, of the conservation reserves to get more production, but they have to be really careful about that because we don't want a whole bunch of highly erodible land being brought into production right now. I think the big short-term thing we can do is to make sure that the World Food Program is adequately funded, that we provide all of the uh, grain, all of the the resources needed to help feed those that are hurting, whether it's in Ukraine or other parts of the world. And we have additional uh, commodities and resources that we can do there. But in the long term, I think we have to look at um, our supply chains. I think we have to look at whether we need to consider some form of international food reserve or grain reserve to deal with crises like this. Mm -hmm. Well, and and on the food reserve or grain reserve point, it's any time that agriculture talks food aid, there seems to be that conversation of in-kind food aid versus actual American commodities that are uh, that are headed abroad. Does a situation like this change that discussion where, you know, there there are commodities abroad, but they can't get anywhere or they're really going to struggle to grow this next year? You know, the supply chain, the shipping problems, it really makes it much more difficult to 
ship commodities overseas. I mean, look at the Black Sea ports. They're basically closed. And, and uh, we have normal shipping problems just with the supply chains that have occurred since the pandemic took place. But when you've got humanitarian problems, you really have to focus on commodities. But uh, long term, I think that uh, we are beginning to realize that we have to provide cash in lieu of commodities to some of these countries to develop their own agriculture systems because they can't really rely on commodities forever. But right now, that, that is needed. That is, uh, it, cash is probably not going to do the trick when you've got hungry people who are starving. Mm -hmm. And well, and we've talked about the domestic approach here, but in terms of America's allies around the world, um, what's what's I mean, is, is enough being done there on the part of our on the part of America's allies? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that uh, one nice thing about not nice, but one thing that's come out of the Ukraine crisis is that that we have produced an alliance between America and most of the countries of the world, particularly in Europe and in Asia that are joining with us to try to deal with this horrendous Russian invasion overseas. Uh, so we are working together. That's good. Second thing is, is that agriculture and food security has now become a higher priority issue among the countries of the world. You talked about the IMF with the G8, with the G20. You know, for years, agriculture was not viewed by a lot of these people, by foreign ministers and secretaries of state and others, as very important at all. Now we realize the significance of food and agriculture security to the world. So that is all, that's positive news and we are working together on that. We'll be right back with more from Secretary Glickman right after this. It's not as simple just to wake up one day and go, I wanna be a conservation farmer. You're changing how your, your farming practice is done. You're changing your operation. Farm Credit supported John and Kelly Watley as they shifted to more sustainable farming, improving the environment where they farm and live. Learn more at farmcredit.com slash climate. Welcome back. Glickman was the Secretary of Agriculture for the majority of the Clinton administration and told us he never really had to deal with an event of the global scale quite like this. But he says when these conversations take place, they can be intense and involve very important food security challenges. Well, USDA has the, such an amazing experience and talent uh, to deal with these food crises. And when I was secretary, I had a great team. Some of you remember Scott Schumacher, who passed away years ago, who was really devoted to working with the White House interagency task force, other agencies of government, State Department, Defense Department, the White House itself. And to, to, you, we've got to make sure that the White House has the right information necessary, uh, knowing what inventories are available. Um, how to get shipping done. You know, it takes a whole of government approach. My worry is, to be honest with you, that there's not a, a central coordinating force in our government to deal with this food crisis. There, you know, we have a special envoy on climate change, and we've had special envoys that try to bring the government together, all the agencies of government. We don't really have that here. The White House is doing it, but I, I'd like to see USDA take a higher profile role. I think it is the agency most equipped to handle this issue. You talked earlier in, in your responses about the, there seems to be a growing understanding of agricultural and, and food security as, in, in light of this conflict. What role do you see then ag and food security taking in, in future global conflicts? I mean, is this, is this potentially a weapon of war or is it a hands-off because we've seen what happened previously? Your thoughts there? Well, I mean, they're, they're it's such a complicated problem. And one, somebody once said, for every complicated problem, there is a simple and a wrong solution. The big thing is to ensure that agriculture and food security has priority within the U.S. government in terms of public policy issues. It's not relegated to a secondary role. And the, and the USDA secretary has a lot of tools at his disposal through the Commodity Credit Corporation uh, to be able to move product both internally and around the world to deal with these crises. And we just need the most modern tools. But some of these problems are a, a beyond agriculture, the supply chain issues, the shipping problems, the storage issues. Um, these, are, these are issues that we never had to deal with before. Mm -hmm. Well, and obviously we talk a lot about, uh, and, and we heard the IMF this week talk about some of the food security issues, the prices abroad, et cetera. But there's also rising food costs here in the United States as well. Uh, and you know, inflation more broadly throughout the economy. What can be done to address the issue of those rising food costs? Well, you know, I mean, uh, first of all, we have problems in production agriculture, particularly with input costs like fertilizer, which is a 
huge problem right now. And, and Russia and Ukraine were big suppliers of fertilizer, and a lot of that was into the United States. So we need to look at fertilizer production in this country, figure out how to increase uh, the production and availability of fertilizer. And, and, and I think we can do a little bit of this, but I don't think we can ramp up significantly in the short term. And that's going to be helpful for farmers and ranchers without question. Um, and, and, you know, I, I also know that farmers have been hit by uh, the crises in fuel prices. So the ethanol issues that the administration did will help to some degree. And, you know, I think that 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 was important to do. I, I you know, look, it's just it. This is a, a holistic problem that's just going to involve all of us because consumers, if they see food prices continuing to go up, up, up and up, this is going to be really hard on particularly lower income and middle income consumers who, who need that uh, stable supply of food at reasonable prices. And, and it, it will affect other programs as well. Our feeding programs are going to be impacted by this and the poor are going to be really remarkably impacted by it. As we, as we bring things to an end here, Mr. Secretary, uh, obviously uh, you and Secretary Vilsack are, are familiar with each other. Um, if he were to, uh, to call you up right now and ask for your advice, What's what? What are you telling him? You know, uh, he's got his hands full. He doesn't need you know, aging secretary, but you know, he's done a very good job as secretary. I guess my, my my hope is is that they listen to him. That he has a priority voice within this administration. That that and and also I I, I do think that there needs to be somebody in a coordinating role in our U.S. government on the issues of food security, like we have with energy security or, or with cyber security and those kinds of things. So I, w I look to this, the agriculture department to provide that leadership role. That's, that's the most significant thing that we can see right now. It does an event like this, I mean, you hate to talk about politics and, and DC influence at a, at a time like this, but does something like this raise the profile of the agriculture secretary, do you think? Well, it certainly raises the profile of the issue of food price stability uh, food uh, availability of, of, of food and commodities uh, pr and prices to not only consumers but to farmers and everybody else. So, so you know, we, we, we take food for granted so often in this country because it's so available to us and prices have historically been relatively stable. So it does elevate the issue without question and, and it elevates the role of the Agriculture Department to be a key participant in our national decision-making processes and to be a key part of the White House decision-making process. And the other thing is, of course, looking to the private sector because, you know, companies in the private sector, whether it's shipping companies or manufacturing companies or processing companies, they're being hit by these problems as well. And so they need to be brought into the solution as well. Mr. Secretary, thanks for joining us. Okay, Spencer, great to be with you. We'll be right back to discuss this week's news with our panel. But first, the upcoming midterm elections are looking like they might present some challenges to a couple of House Ag Committee Democrats. Anna Pagel has more in this week's Map It Out. As we get closer to the midterm elections, there are a handful of House races to keep your eye on. The Cook Political Report recently released updated rating changes to eight congressional seats two of which impact two members of the House Agriculture Committee. But to fully understand the changes, let's first break down the ratings and what they mean. Each congressional district is rated based on an expected outcome. Each party is broken up into three categories, solid, likely, and lean. Then there is a category split directly in the middle, called a toss-up. This means the race could go either way. The first notable rating change is in Virginia's District 7, this district is currently held by Democrat Abigail Spamberger, who currently chairs the House Ag Subcommittee for Conservation and Forestry. The Cook Political Report previously listed Spamberger's district as lean Democrat. That has now changed to a toss-up race. It is important to keep in mind the state of Virginia did redistrict this year. Spamberger's new district is more urban and does not include the suburbs of Richmond, which currently are a part of her district. Spamberger also does not live in the new District 7. However, she still plans to run for that seat. The other congressional district to watch is New York's District 19. This seat is held by Democrat Antonio Delgado. He chairs the House Ag Subcommittee for Commodity Exchanges, Energy, and Credit. The new rating switched his district from likely Democrat to lean Democrat. New York also went through redistricting this year, 
and the 19th district expanded its territory by picking up areas that are currently held by Republican Claudia Tenney. For this week's Map It Out, I'm Hannah Pegel. Farmers are always there for each other. We shed tears together, we celebrate together, but we also grow together. Farm Bureau is the largest general farm organization in the country. We have the farmers back. If you're a farmer and you're not a member, we would welcome you into our Farm Bureau family. And if you want to know more about agriculture, come be part of this great family. Happy to be joined today by an expert panel to discuss a wide range of issues here on AgriPulse Newsmakers. As we bring them into the conversation here, we have Kip Tom, a former uh, ambassador to, to the United Nations for the U.S. On, food, on the Food and Agriculture Organization as well as the World Food Program. Krista Harden, a uh, former Deputy Secretary at the Department of Agriculture, who now heads up the U.S. Dairy Export Council, as well as John Bays, a oilseed industry analyst. Appreciate the time and the expertise that you all will be sharing with us here. And Krista, I want to I want to start with you because we're seeing uh, really a, a lot of figures this week, uh, fresh figures on the current uh, on, on the food price outlook. Uh, we know very well that there's rising input costs. This current price picture on both uh, the front end and the back end for, for food, what does that mean for the American producer? Well, certainly I'll, I'll start with dairy farmers because I think they're indicative of what's happening. You know, input costs are going up. Demand is up worldwide for our products. Um, but, you know, we got to have products to sell and we got to have buyers willing to pay for the price. But it, it certainly is a time of uncertainty and question, you know, very unusual times, frankly. Um, and food security is on top of mind, I think, for, for every farmer and certainly for dairy farmers. We're a big part of the diet. We want to make sure that we remain there. Well, and Kip, we, we saw the, the IMF come out with some new figures uh, here this week about uh, what they're expecting in terms of global food prices, uh, obviously rising numbers there. When there is a situation like this, uh, kind of under underpinning all of this is, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What are the phone calls like at, uh, at, at the, the UN, at WFP and the FAO, and, and how does the United States fit into the picture? You know, in, in terms of, uh, you know, global humanitarian efforts and relief, I speak to Executive Director Beasley quite frequently. And as we say often, you can phrase this up in one, qu one quick comment, uh, those that are most affected are those at least can afford high, high priced food. So we certainly would like to see an end of the, the, the current uh, price levels that we see today uh, for those in countries across the continent of Africa that live on less than $2 a day uh, for their food budget and nearly 60% of it's spent on food. This is a disaster that's uh, it's on the edge of, of occurring at this point in time. I've seen some bigger numbers than what I've even heard from the IMF, uh, which has really got me concerned about our trend going forward. You say you're hearing bigger numbers. Well, I mean, what are the bigger numbers that you're hearing? Well, I think we heard 10 million uh, from uh, one of the one of the different uh, leaders there at the IMF this week. Uh, but uh, I'm hearing some people that are talking much larger numbers, 10 to 15 times what they are talking about. Mm -hmm. And John, I want to bring you into the fold here because we talk about uh, obviously the, the the Russia and Ukraine situation right now. Two countries that are major uh, major exporters, and particularly in, in the fields of corn and wheat, but also uh, major uh, sources of sunflower oil. Wondering what this action has done globally to the to the condition for uh, you know oilseed prices, which were, were already pretty pretty robust. Well, <clears throat> we already have very high oil uh, veg oil prices. Uh, Cause of problems in Brazil and weather, and uh, um, a lot of I think some problems in Southeast Asia because of lack of of uh, labor to uh, uh, pick the uh, palm bunches and the palm groves. But now we've got this, where 48% uh, of all of the sunflower oil in the world is exported uh, from uh, uh, Ukraine, and the other big supplier is Russia. Is that, that oil is, would be coming from Ukraine is not happening because they don't have access to their Black Sea ports for export. Uh, they're trying to move some uh, west through into Western Europe and maybe to the export market. But without that, I mean, we've seen problems from in countries, particularly like India, that imports a lot of uh, sunflower oil, all of a sudden can't get what they want. So it's causing some major problems. And I think it's going to get worse over time here, um, you know, the, the, because uh, 
Uh, you know, there's not, we had a shortage of rapeseed oil uh, in Canada last year. We don't know what it's going to be this year. And, and God knows what it's going to be like when our crop this year with the drought that we've got out west. We'll be right back with more from our panel right after this. Looking closer, seeing further. That's how we do it. At Curious Plot, we're driven to find what's next for agriculture, animal care, and food. We stay curious because that's what it takes to grow understanding. That's how we plot strategies and tell stories that get results time after time. Marketing, communications, and consulting that look closer and see further. Curious Plot. We can't wait to help you tell your story. Welcome back. As leaders around the world look to address the hunger issues that could be fueled by higher food prices, what does that mean for political stability throughout the world? Our panel takes a look. So I talk to a couple of producers in the Ukraine quite frequently, and uh, they are people across the nation starting to plant some crops there. Uh, it's a much different uh, environment than what they ever had before. I'm, I'm talking to guys that have people operating planters or carrying guns with them and other explosive materials to pr protect themselves. But the reality is that the Black Sea ports, they don't expect them to start functioning again until after this war has come to a close. And no one can really predict that right now. Land mines or excuse me, sea mines are in place so, to protect the seaports, but yet at the same time, the Russians have put uh, sea mines along the different uh, channels going out. But it is the 70% of the wheat that went into Africa, went in through the Sahel of Africa, came out of the Black Sea ports. Well, that's not exist today. So they had that bought at much lower contract prices. They had uh, ocean freight lined up at most much lower prices. And now they're going to Argentina, United States, and Australia to a certain extent to try to bring that wheat in. So we know we have a finite budget and uh, we're limited on our ability to really have the impact that we should have had in combating hunger across the Sahel of Africa and many other countries in the world that are uh, food insecure. Uh, this could be actually much worse than the Arab Spring back in 2010 and 2012. The potential setup is there. And, and this is specifically, you think, targeted in the, in the African region or are there, are there other areas of the world that uh, we should be watching as well? I'd say Africa is number one. Uh, number two would probably be Middle East. Number three would be probably Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Krista, I want to bring you back into the fold here because obviously uh, the phrase supply chain issues is not a new one in, in farm policy conversations. I feel like we've been talking about that for quite a while here. But uh, I the issues that we're seeing in the Black Sea, the, the shutdown uh, that we've seen at the port in Shanghai, how has that exacerbated the supply chain issues that we've seen around the world? Um, it's, it's unbelievable, frankly, what we're dealing with. You know, we get a little bit of relief right after the holidays, and then we have the problems that you just mentioned. So it just exacerbates um, the situation, I think, for the U.S. trying to get products out. There is demand for our products, dairy and, and everything, frankly. But we've got to get the product to customers. You're also seeing dairy, on top of everything, very short supplies, production down in the U.S., production down in the U. and in New Zealand. So the demand is there, the prices are high, and then we have the supply chain, just really horrific um, vulnerabilities. I think that's one thing we've learned. This is a vulnerable system, and we're gonna have to make changes and investments and really make improvements if we don't want this problem not to last, um, become a lingering, lasting problem. Well, and, and as you look at kind of the, the more lasting effects, we currently see uh, farmers being subject to some, some input prices that they really don't have a whole lot of control over. What is, you know, how, how is the U.S. dairy industry going to be able to, to navigate this, given the fact that, again, they can't really control those commodity prices, which are so key to U.S. dairy inputs? Yes, the prices are high, but the, the inputs are high as well. You're exactly right. It's, it really it varies farm to farm. You know, whether you add cows right now because prices are high and supply is tight, but can you afford to do that? It's questions that each farmer is having to deal with. Each organization is having to look at where is that balance? How do you make sure we can have enough supply, not just for the U.S., but for the rest of the world who does depend on many of, of our products? So it is, it's, really, um, it's a really tight rope they're having to walk right now. And looking at fertilizer prices, energy prices, um, feed prices, you know, it's, it's a trifecta right now for, for each farmer. Mm -hmm. John, we, we obviously know the, the production issues that are going to be present in, in Russia and the Ukraine for, for pretty obvious reasons. But as you discussed, weather has been a bit of an issue in the United States as well. 
your thoughts on what a, a you know, uh, potentially a rough growing season, uh, weather-wise, because no one can predict a drought at this point, but your thoughts on, uh, on what uh, weather and overall U.S. production is going to mean to the, to the global industry at this point? Certainly. Uh, I mean, first, to start off in the soybean industry, well, South America has got 35 million tons less production this year than was predicted earlier in the year. <clears throat> now it shifts to our season. Uh, we're the second largest producer of soybeans, and we're going to uh, expect it to plant close to 90 million, uh, million acres this year. But if you look out at the weekly drought map, it's quite dry out in the western uh, uh, Corn Belt. Uh, and, you know, there's, we don't know what it's going to be like. Uh, we, all, we need to remember we haven't had a bad crop in uh, um, soybeans and corn in the U.S. since 2012. So we're 10 years in a row of good weather. And if we don't have a good crop this year, um, you know, who knows what prices are going to go to. you got $16, $17 soybeans now, $8 corn. Uh, if we don't have a good crop, that could be, we could be looking at well over $10 corn and $20 soybeans. Uh, and you, what will that do to global demand? I mean, the demand destruction that we're already probably seeing uh, in China and elsewhere is going to get worse. And uh, you're going to see a lot of people really get in trouble in the livestock sector uh, and, of course, for human consumption. Our thanks to this week's panel. We'll be right back with more AgriPulse Newsmakers. But first, Hannah Pegel dives into the world of biofuel feedstocks in this week's Ag by the Numbers. If you are a canola producer, you may soon have a new market for your crop, depending on a decision that will be made by the Environmental Protection Agency. That decision is to determine whether or not canola oil can be used as a feedstock for renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. Since 2010, canola oil has been used as a feedstock for biodiesel, but not renewable diesel or any other advanced biofuel. The main difference between biodiesel and renewable diesel is that renewable diesel is chemically identical to petroleum and can directly fuel diesel engines without needing to be distilled or mixed like its biodiesel counterpart. Under the Renewable Fuel Standard, biofuels must reduce emissions by at least 50% to qualify as an advanced biofuel. According to the White House, renewable diesel made from canola would lower greenhouse gas emissions by 63 to 69% compared to conventional diesel. Allowing the use of canola oil could also provide an alternative to soybeans, especially at a time when vegetable oil prices are skyrocketing worldwide. Canola oil is seen as a premium food oil, which many experts say will remain the crop's primary market. Noah Wicks has more details in his story on agripulse.com. For this week's Ag by the Numbers, I'm Hannah Pegel. Did you know Agripulse has all your favorite podcasts, including Open Mic, Newsmakers, and Drive Time. Take us wherever you go. Subscribe at agripulse.com or on Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts. Agriculture Future of America is a nonprofit building transformational leaders in food and agriculture. AFA prepares college students to join the workforce as innovative and engaged young professionals who will shape the future of agriculture. Head to agfuture.org to find out how you can get involved. Thanks again for tuning in for another episode of AgriPulse Newsmakers. Before we let you go, here's what's on the horizon for the week to come. The beef industry will be front and center in a pair of hearings on Capitol Hill. On Tuesday, the Senate Ag Committee is scheduled to mark up the Cattle Price Discovery and Transparency Act championed by two of its members, Republicans Deb Fisher of Nebraska and Chuck Grassley of Iowa. The next day, the House Agriculture Committee will hear from the CEOs of the largest meat packers in the country. On top of that, House Ag will have a Farm Bill Oversight hearing on Thursday to look into the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And Ag Secretary Tom Vilsack is scheduled to testify before the House Ag Appropriations Subcommittee. And don't forget about an AgriPulse webinar on Wednesday afternoon about scaling innovation for climate action. We'll have the latest developments on those hearings and other key moments in food and ag policy on agripulse.com. For AgriPulse Newsmakers, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one. Newsmakers is a production of AgriPulse Communications. For more ag policy news, visit agripulse.com. You can also find our new content on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. 
Don't forget to follow AgriPulse and our correspondents on social media to get breaking news and more.